subjective language, an account of subjective language for a while now. We developed a, an account um, that is in a paper that's currently under review of linguistics and philosophy, which I like very much. It, it, it leverages the idea that language, that there's a ton of semantic uncertainty in language, something that semanticists in particular typically ignore when we're doing compositional semantic analysis because it makes no difference. Um, but one of the neat things about that project was that we took that just truism about language and leveraged it, leverage it in what we think is a top drawer uh, pragmatic account of subjective meaning. Um, part of that work, too, was geared towards explaining what I'm the main thing of interest in today's talk, which I'll show you in a second. Um, but we were never quite satisfied with the explanation that we got in that paper. So even while that paper is under review, we've written another paper which responds to our proposals in the previous paper. Um, so that's what you're going to hear today. Um, this was written actually because we, we were contributing this to a, uh, an invited, um, I mean, a special issue of inquiry, um, and the deadline for the paper was actually November 1st today. Um, so, but we got a two week extension so we can take all the feedback that I'm getting now. So I'm looking forward to that. All right, so let me give you the, the data point that's the starting place for this work. Um, so, uh, one of the classic, the, the, the kind of example predicate that people bring out when they're interested in talking about subjective language uh, is the adjective tasty. And this stands in for a whole set of expressions which refer to personal taste. Tasty, fun, boring, interesting, fascinating, etc. A lot of these expressions are, um, in English, are derived from verbs that, that express psychological states like, like um, fright or um, interest and so forth. They're nasty. Um, so a feature of these expressions is that an assertion involving these expressions implicate that the speaker has some kind of direct experience of a sort that's relevant for judging whether the predicate holds. So if A says, or if A and B are at a restaurant, A says you should get sea urchin, it's tasty. B says, is that what you usually get? No, I've never tried it. Sounds strange, it's off. Okay? <clears throat> and it's off both in instances of um, positive assertions and in denials. So likewise, if A says, don't get sea urchin, it's not tasty. And B says, when did you try it? And A then says, I've never had it. A sounds off. Okay? We're not going to take A's recommendations, at least that's pretty clear. <clears throat> now, the fact that you get this inference under both an assertion and its negation might make you think it's a presupposition. But it's pretty um, clear that it's not a presupposition because it doesn't project out of the usual context in which presuppositions project. Right? So if I say, if sea urchin is tasty, I'll order some, I am, there's no implication that I've had sea urchin. Right? Or if I use an epistemic modal, like, look at what all those people are eating. Sea urchin must be tasty. It doesn't, there's, no, there's no implication that I've tasty. Um, likewise, we can, oops, sorry, sorry, just, just to make that point clear, if we compare um, examples that involve a proper presupposition, um, so these examples involve the anaphoric presupposition that we get with the um, additive particle two in English. So if I say, I ordered sea urchin two, it presupposes that I ordered something else. I'm saying it without, it, it, what it presupposes depends on the prosody. So here, Hear these sentences with accent or, or prosodic stress on the things that are capitalized. I didn't order sea urchin two. It still commits me to have ordered something else. If I order sea urchin two, I don't have enough money to get home. I've still ordered something else. I might order sea urchin two. I ordered something else. So that that's the signature of a presupposition. In this case, the inference that I ordered something other than sea urchin. So the 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 acquaintance inference is. Um, likewise, unlike presuppositions, you can't get rid of the acquaintance inference. So in special cases, you can deny uh, or cancel a presupposition. 
I didn't order sea urchin too. That's the only thing I ordered. I don't regret that I ordered sea urchin because I never ordered anything at all. That's fine. But I can't say sea urchin isn't tasty. I've never tasted it. And it's just you know, fat. <clears throat> Um, so, in, but there, there are, in addition to the cases we looked at earlier with the conditional and the modals, we can also get rid of this uh, inference under various kinds of hedging contexts. So I might say sea urchin is tasty, or well, apparently sea urchin is very tasty, but it wasn't in Japan. And then again, I'm not anything that, that that creates a sort of making it clear that my tummy is sea urchin. Um, and then a, a very special kind of case, um, if it's clear, if it's clear in the context that I intend some other entity to be the experiential locus, if you will, um, I can also make an interpretation for all of that. Right? So if I'm holding up some, a new bowl of cat food and I show it to her, I say, hey, this cat food is really tasty. That's a little weird because it implies that I'm eating cat food. But if my cat's over here on the floor, or if I follow up my other input saying, hey, this food's not tasty, my cat refuses. And it's fine in virtue of the fact that we're evaluating that sentence in some sense from the cat perspective. And indeed, now we get the inference that the cat's tasty. All right, so I mentioned that we have an account of this. Um, our account in the paper that is listed here, um, we say that this inference um, follows from a certain view on the evidential basis for belief given a particular kind of semantically underdetermined propositional content for these utterances, these assertions. Um, I'm not gonna go through these other analyses in detail because we don't have time, but, but basically, there are, I think there are literally only these four analyses out there. So this is a phenomenon that hasn't really received a lot of attention. Um, Hazel Pearson has a paper where she treats these as presuppositions. We just saw that they're not presuppositions. Um, Philip Nynan analyzes them in terms of uh, the knowledge norm on assertion, the account we'll end up with is sort of similar to that, but it's more general. Um, and a student of mine who just finished his PhD at um, Santa Chicago, Patrick Munoz, um, analyzes these in terms of a particular kind of evidentiality of the assertions for this language. So I'm not gonna tell you why we think these are wrong. I'll say a little bit about it later on. I'll point you to other things if you wanna ask me about it in terms of <coughs> All right, so here's the, the broad picture of what I'm gonna to try to come into today. So what we're gonna argue is that um, these autocentric uses that he uses where I'm meant to be the perspectival source, so to speak, um, are tools for expressing <coughs> experiential attitudes, um, which are states of mind that can be acquired only in virtue of having experiences of a certain sort. Um, and in particular, you know, we're going to propose that utterances to express different attitudes insofar as they come with distinct constraints on the state of mind that the speaker must be in in order for the utterance to be relevant. So we're going to be inspired by proper expressivist work, um, and I'm going to show you that work. But in the end, we're not going to give what you might call a proper expressivist analysis. Instead, we're going to try to get an expressive component out of the felicity. So just to give you a sense of how we're going to get to you know, the, the crucial data, we're going to say in a sentence like nine, um, the speaker expresses an attitude that one can have only in virtue of having faith in sea urchin. Um, and the reason why nine is weird is because the speaker immediately denies that she's had the experiences which are constituted of that attitude. Okay. And then these other cases involving hedges, ex uh, modals, ex conditionals, exocentric these are going to be fine because in the semantics that I'll give you, they don't express experiential attitudes, but instead express beliefs, um, which can be acquired in one of the ways. And, you know, I mean, one way to kind of get a handle on, like, the, the, the just kind of pointing at this, we'll come back to it later, on what exactly the issue is. I mean, Stefan can be sitting over there eating sea urchin and tell me, hey, this stuff is tasty. I might, because I trust his taste, come to believe That, on a, that alone doesn't give me license to go out and start telling other people, asserting to other people that sea urchin is tasty. That's the central um, observation. Okay. 
we just have to do this. Alright. Um, here's the roadmap. First, I'll lay out the expressive intuition. Here we're going to take a little bite of detour through metaethics. Um, one of the consequences of the analysis I'm going to give you is that it's going to extend to those cases as well. Um, certainly in semantics, most of the work on, on subjectivity is focused on predicates of personal taste and has left other kinds of, you know, like just quote unquote subjective language aside. Um, we're going to try to take some of that on. Um, and I'll go through, I'll just quickly go through the usual challenges that are presented to proper expressive analyses. Some of which are familiar. Then I'll present our analysis informally and formally, and then we'll kind of go through some things that we think it solves, and then some questions that arise. Um, all right, so here's the starting point. Um, so there's a situation in metaethics that there's a kind of special conceptual or necessary connection between accepting a, a moral judgment and, and being motivated to act in a certain way. Um, so here's a quote from Stevenson. Uh, goodness must have a, a magnetism. A person who rec recognizes something to be good must acquire a stronger tendency to act in its favor than Um, you can't define, you can't define good in, in, in the I'm not a metaethicist, neither is Paul Dash. But, but we, you know, in, in thinking about subjectivity, one wants to think through the different ways that people talk about this language, and, and so this, this is inspiration here from this particular line of thought. Okay. So, he, you know, here's another way to think about it, right? Moral thoughts have a special connection to motivation. Moral thoughts, because they have they, 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 they involve a different kind of mental state. Right? Non-moral thoughts involve kind of mind to world direction of fit. We represent the world to be a certain way, and if we discover the world should be different, we should change our thoughts. Right? Moral thoughts represent what the world should be like. And but discovering that the world is not like that isn't easy on its own. So, if this view is right, then actually, if we would expect that we should get a similar kind of pattern to what we saw with the experiential language. Now, it turns out to be kind of hard to construct the linguistic examples that really test for this. So, this is another place where commentary, if you think, is kind of online with the intuitions here, commentary is helpful. So, this is our attempt to do it. So, here we're using this collocation that I have no opinion about. Um, which is meant to kind of get at that Stevensonian idea that you just sort of, it's a merely an idea. It's imposed on your will to act in no way. I mean, it, it's imposed in no way on your will to act. Right? It's, you know, nothing. I recognize it as a proposition. That's it. And so, D, if you kind of go with that, I think we can hear I have no opinion in that way, right? Um, so I say tax fraud is wrong, but I have no opinion about community. It seems weird. It seems like you know, hold those two positions compared to tax fraud is illegal, but I have no opinion. Um, learning about carbon, sorry, lowering carbon emissions is right, but I have no opinion about the union. Lowering carbon emissions is legal, but I have no opinion about the union. So there really do seem to be some contrast. So I'm trying to, we're trying to avoid language of the sort, you know, tax fraud is wrong, but I, I don't disapprove of it, which would be the kind of more natural thing you might think test is clearly bad, because the worry is that that's contradicting the sort of more at issue part of the union, you know, rather than what we're getting at, what we're thinking of to be explicit conditions, right? Disapproval is presumably part of the at issue content of law. That would be, you know, going back to the taste expressions, that would be like saying this is tasty, but I don't like it. And that's not the that's not the inference that we're interested in. We're interested in this is tasty, but I've never tasted it. Right? This is the kind of idea. Um, this is preserved under negation. Taking advantage of tax loopholes is an 
wrong, but I have no opinion about doing it, versus it's not a legal Committing more carbon isn't right, but I have no opinion about doing it. Saying that it isn't legal. All right, I think we can, it shows the exocentricity though too. So, um, you can't really see that very well. These are the heptapods from the film Arrival, which is where, you know, the, the spaceships land on Earth and they said, you know, the one character, no, sorry, the one film where the, the, the main protagonist is a linguist, so of course, it's <laughs> a linguist's favorite film. Um, but, you know, let's say the linguist brings an anthropologist with her as she's going and trying to work on how to decipher the language these people are doing. And the anthropologist makes these observations about heptapod behavior. And this is where not having that light would be good. You can see they've got multiple tentacles here. And they squirt, they can squirt these jets of ink out of their tentacles and form some structures on the glass, which they come to realize is the written form of the language. Let's say that the anthropologist observed that the middle tentacle is never used for that purpose. And in fact, at one point, when some, some heptapod tries to do it, and the other one just knocks it down. You know? So the anthropologist makes a bunch of observations, and then might very well say, using the middle tentacle to communicate is wrong. Right? But I think in that context, it's clear that the anthropologist doesn't have any motivational stance towards the wrongness, towards, towards the proposition, towards the proposition, right? Because it doesn't, the, the, the anthropologist doesn't have tentacles. Um, and so this would be the kind of case, so again, this is, the, I think, recognized in this literature, so there's the, Alan Gibbery talks about the notion of the sensible CAD. Um, you know, you're debating something, you're debating what counts as harassment. He says, anyone who doesn't give a damn, for whom no question or action or attitude, actual or hypothetical, hinges on the classification of what's right or wrong, or what's harassment or not harassment, um, can't join into the conversation as a full-fledged use of this kind of language can only be parasitic on the usage of those who do care. So he's kind of in that parasitic comment, I think he's pointing at this exocentricity, but also at the idea that if you're arguing in a way in, in a situation about some moral thought, then it's clear that you have no opinion about it in the sense that we're talking about. You're, 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 you're insincere in a particular kind of way. As I'll say in a second, you're kind of like an answer, right? As opposed to a proper, properly engaged So that so this is so we take that this is an example of exocentric interpretation, like we saw with the experiential language. All right, and also like experiential language, these inferences disappear in the same context. So if committing tax fraud is wrong, one should do it. Uh, if reducing carbon emissions is right, one should do it. Just like the examples we've been looking at. So I need not be committed. I need not have an opinion. I have no opinion about not tipping for bad service, but since everyone else obviously disapproves of it, it must be wrong. Fine. But since everybody else obviously disapproves it, it's wrong. Fine. Except in an exocentric kind of meeting, which is a little harder to get here than it is in the anthropologist case that I saw. I've never tried sea urchin, but since everybody else obviously enjoys it, it's tasty. It's wrong. Right? Versus it must be. And hedges, right? So apparently not tipping for bad service is wrong, why is that? I hear the tipping UPS guy is right. Um, um, David works there, not that he works for the Space Force. Actually, that's not tipping the UPS that's guy is one shouldn't have a computer like that. But that's okay. According to David Woods. Alright, so 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 again, the match between these two cases isn't perfect. So uh, so 21, let's say that my son has never been to an art museum before. It's not true, but let's say, let's say it is true. But his best friend, his parents drag him around to art museums, and he always keeps telling my son, ah, oh, it's boring, it's boring, it's boring. So I say, he says, art museums are boring. And I say, when have you visited one? I've never visited one. Right? That's like teenager talk, right? <laughs> so you sound, you sound like a teenager. You know, if he starts making an argument about tax fraud, and I know he has no opinion about that. So he doesn't know what taxes are yet. 
I think he's just making the gratuitous argument. He sounds like a yes. Right, so, this, so both of these are defective, but they're kind of defective in slightly different ways. They're slightly different terms. Now we're going to have something to say about the nature of the defect here. And then, you know, all right, so I was point this title of the talk, I, I had to do that. There's a lot of express experience with the Hendrix. And so we're not actually going to talk much about aesthetic language, but it seems to work in essentially, I mean, as, as you might expect in the same way. But if I say Jimmy's performance, or the experience is all right, it's beautiful, it's a venue, I do like it. That one was, you know, that just sounds weird. Or when did you hear it? And so I think aesthetic language may kind of combine both its sort of judgmental stance and an experiential stance, um, but um, you know we need to look more at that. All right, so here, so what, what does the expressivist say, say about this stuff? Okay. So the classical expressivist account is that assertions, I mean, you know, we should put assertions in a little bit of scare quotes here, um, involving Taste predicates, moral language, aesthetic predicate language, whatever else is meant to fit in this bucket, aren't really assertions at all, um, but instead expressions of the relevant kind of um, attitude, experiential, relational, judgmental, and so on. All right, so sea urchins is taste, young this view is an expression of gustatory pleasure, tax fraud is bond is an expression of moral approval, and so forth. Um, and, you know, if, if this were the right account, I think we, all these facts would follow, right? If you, assume, if you assume pretty reasonably that you can sincerely express an attitude only if you're in the state of mind that constitutes that attitude, then the acquaintance inferences are just going to come out, right? Um, but there's lots and lots of, I mean, you know, a whole bunch of arguments against true expressivist account, which says that the semantic content of these utterances are not propositions, but these, 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 these attitudes, right? So you've got the disagreement problem, right? So we can, I say Sears is tasty, Stefan says that's wrong, Sears is not tasty, we're just clearly disagreeing, we'll, we'll come back to disagreement later, this is one of these so-called flawless disagreements, but the point is that if we thought that Sears is tasty, was an expression of the attitude, I like sea urchin, then it's not clear why we engage in this disagreement. Because you know, I, I say I like sea urchin, someone says that's wrong, I don't like sea urchin. It's work, right? Um, propositional anaphora, half believes that sea urchin is tasty. I mean, one, already you have to kind of figure out how you can get an expressive meaning to embed under believe, but assuming you can do that. Um, Happily, Sears is tasty. But Kimberly Sears is tasty. Happily, is that too? So there's something that Kim and Pat both believe that seems to be a good deduction, um, but that can't be. A, you can't get that deduction if, if you know we've got a, Kim's expression of tastiness and Pat's expression of tastiness. Right? Those are different things. And then the usual kind of break of each problems of embedding these guys on your variable. These are just a few of the many arguments. Chapter one of John McFarland's book is kind of dealing with them. So it's so the literature. Um, the literature motivating, in particular, relativism <coughs> as a as a kind of subjective meaning has made these cases against expressivism. I don't know much of it so it's a problem. So we want to capture the expressivist intuition <coughs> that acquaintance inferences. Um, arise from the fact that when we use these expressions, we make an assertion we're expressing an attitude. Right? And you can only have that kind of attitude if you're in the right kind of mental state. And so for the personal taste predicates, you're expressing an experiential attitude, and that's the kind of thing you can only have in virtue of having had a certain kind of experience. Um, but we want to avoid the problems from expressivism by giving a semantics in which the which when you use these things to make an assertion, you're doing just that, you're making an assertion, you're presenting the propositional content and proposing that we have the common ground with that propositional content in the usual way, so that's the line in the line, in the right. And 
So the strategy for doing that is to look to the norms of assertion and find in them already, actually, they're already there. You didn't realize they were there until you started working for them, but they're already there. To find in them just what we need to, to get this tool. All right. So you might call what we're doing cheap expressive. Um, so that's the, this idea that I mentioned at the beginning. We want to say different speech acts express different attitudes in the sense that their felicity conditions are such that the speaker must be in the mental state that the thing arises at the speech. Right? So the kind of the ex ex expression is emerging from satisfaction of felicity conditions. So, so here's, here's how it's going to kind of work in the case where attitude that an assertion of a proposition P expresses is the one that the speaker must hold towards P in order for it to be assertable because the norm of assertion is restricted to its holding. We observe that utterances of propositions containing taste predicates, predicates of personal taste, express experiential attitudes. Holding that attitude entails having had the relevant experience, having been experienced. Um, if we can get to here, this is to get us the results that we want. And the thing that we need to kind of deal with, that the, that the puzzle, that the gap that needs to be filled is sort of the analytical work is going, um, is that the norms of assertion for a proposition containing a case predicate require the speaker to be, to hold a certain type of experiential attitude. Willing to go too expressive even about that. And then we get to here, then we're fine. We've got another one. And then, you know, obviously, if you take, pull out the predicate, taste predicate and plug in moral predicate, you're going to get different results. And then take out that and plug in an objective predicate, you're going to get different results. All right, so here, here's, so I said, look to the norms of assertion. Um, and, we, and so if we do that, and we just think about the standard examples that we try out for talking about felicity conditions on assertion, you know, we've already talked about assertions coming with requirements on mental state, on the, uh, the speaker having a certain attitude. And so the objective propositions um, require the speaker to have some basis for belief about the truth of the proposition that's being asserted, right? So if A says, Jimmy was stoned very Inspired experience in Monterey. And he says, Why do you believe that? And A says, I have no reason to believe that. A sounds, that sounds wrong. Right? It's wrong. This is like from Boston. Right? Um, now, oh, boy. So, and, and, and later, Austin Plus. Um, right? So, you, you go out there and look at literature on assertion. And you'll find things like this. One should only assert what one knows. One should only assert what one believes. The Bach, who takes assertion to be an expression of belief, actually. Um, so this is, this is, you know, like I said, this is already out there. Um, what we want to argue is that the standard cases are just special cases, special specific incidents of what's really a more general felicity condition on assertion, which applies to the other cases in just as well. In, in the same way, but with slightly different outcomes. And let me highlight, so usually when people talk about these cases that I just gave, like the one, you know, uh, Jimmy was stoned. Why do you believe that? You know, um, you know, why do you believe that? I'm stoned. Okay. Um, so usually people think of that kind of example as involving an evidential condition. Right? That this is infelicitous because a is making explicit that they have no evidence in support of their belief, right? And, and you know, so Bryce's maximum quality, which one can just think of as uh, felicity conditions on assertion, says don't say what you believe to be false, don't say what you lack evidence for. That's the way we usually think about these kinds of assertions. But we want to resist thinking of this as an evidential condition, actually. Um, and. Why 
record. This, that's also how people often talk about the experiential language. That looks like an evidential condition. You need direct evidence to make a certain let's take. But the reason why I want to resist that is that, that that doesn't seem right for the motivational implication or for, for, the, for the implications we saw that are associated with utterance of things like this is right and this is wrong. It doesn't really, it doesn't seem right to characterize that as about evidence. That's about if you know we go with the line from Stevens and Gibbard and the metaphysical expressiveness, that's about being in a particular Evidence doesn't matter. It's being in a mental state. That's why we don't have to change our moral judgments in this presence of three mental facts. <clears throat> so here's the here is the condition that we want to propose. I'll do an informal version and a more formal version. An assertion of a proposition P is felicitous, just in case the speaker is in a mental state that distinguishes between worlds in which P is true and worlds in which P is false. In the right way. And the in the right way itself will be what we need to fill in for different kinds of propositions, moral, ethical, uh, experiential, um, objective, et cetera. So when this is, when this holds, we'll say that P is grounded in the relevant mental state, and then we'll, we'll see how it works. So, doxastic grounding and the, the basis for belief inference that we see in objective propositions, a certain objective proposition is gonna work something like this. A proposition P, is grounded in the speaker's beliefs, just in case the speaker's doxastic commitments distinguish the P worlds from the not P worlds. They can tell the difference. Um, if an assertion of P is felicitous, just in case P is grounded in the speaker's beliefs, that assertion of P is felicitous, just in case the speaker's, I need a better terminology here, not incredulous toward P. By that I mean um, not in a state where they, their beliefs don't determine P or not P. I mean incredulous here in like a li very literal sense. I don't think this is the best word here, but we'll see why I'm wearing it. In this case, P would be, an assertion of P would be, would count as an expression of belief, given our relation between felicity and belief and the of expressions. All right, turning to experiential predicates. A proposition P is grounded in the speaker's experiences, just in case the speaker's experiential commitments distinguish the P worlds from the not P if an assertion of P is felicitous, just in case P is grounded in the speaker's experiential state, then it's felicitous just in case the speaker is not inexperienced relative to P. They must have the experiences that, that draw the distinctions. In this case, assertion is an expression of experience. And then for the normative case, a proposition is grounded in the speaker's norm acceptance, just in case the speaker's normative commitments distinguish if an assertion of P is solicitous just in case it's grounded in this way, then it's solicitous just in case the speaker is not unmotivated. So that's the way that, the, so, so you see the parallel between the different cases and why we don't want to call it an evidential constraint. We want to, basically the, the evidential constraint and what we call the basis for belief inference is just a special case. All right, so the more formal part. Um, take the denotation function, assign extensions of possible worlds given some context of utterance. For any context of utterance, we want to be able to pick out, we say, the speaker, the home world, context set, which all the worlds compatible with one another. Add to that, just you know, straightforwardly, um, ways of picking out an agent's uh, various kinds of um, the attitudes that we're interested in. So a speaker's doxastic commitment to the worlds that are compatible with their beliefs in a world, uh, their experiential commitment to add a world, are the worlds compatible with their experiences in that world, and so forth. Um, this seems pretty straightforward, and, and we might, we probably want to assume a few things about the relations between these sets, um, in particular that experience and normative judgment We might want to say that direct evidence determines belief as well. It sort of depends on what we think about the relation between perception and belief. So that we don't doesn't really matter for the question of security, but um, the other question would be important. So this is sort of you know what, what this kind of tells you is you can be doxastically committed to something without necessarily being experientially committed to it. I 
we believe that sea urchin is tasty is virtue of watching stuff on it without any experience. Right? Without any experience, you can get sea urchin in this country. All right, so here's the more formal notion of the grounding principle that I gave you earlier. Um, I mean, maybe the intuitive one was enough, but we did formalize it, we have formalized it. Um, so the starting point is to say, okay, you can identify worlds that are, so alpha here is meant to, I'm gonna fill that in with these different attitudes. So worlds that are alpha indistinguishable from W in some context are um, just the worlds that, um, that whose truth value is identical. They're either given, given, um, so the, take your attitudes, get the propositions that are entailed by them, and then pick up the ones whose uh, truth value are identical. That is, your attitudes don't determine, or don't distinguish between whether they're, they treat them the same for truth or falsity. Okay. Um, given that, we can partition an information state like the common ground, uh, sorry, the context set, into cells that agree on different commitments, and then we can define our grounding relative to some partition partitioning, we say a proposition is grounded in a particular partitioning just in case when you go through all the partitions in there for each one of those, the, the um, proposition is treated the same in each of them. So it's either treated, it's either true in each partition or it's false in each partition. So the way to think of these partitions is that they're indeterminate about various other kinds of propositions, but they're fixed in decisions about the truth or falsity of the things that ground them. That are grounded in them. Which is just to say kind of what I said before. So this would be the case only if the relevant attitude distinguishes between B and non-B. So we might in that case we would say that the speaker is opinionated about truth or falsity. And of course what it takes to be in the relevant mental state to be opinionated the right way depends on the kind of attitude that you've got. So experiential grounding, which is going to be relevant for the um, the taste predicates. We identify the worlds that are experientially indistinguishable. We partition our information state into cells that agree on experiential commitments. The experiential grounded, experientially grounded, is for all of, for some proposition, is for that proposition to be true or false in each of the partitions. Right? And that's going to be the case only if your experiential commitments distinguish between B and not B. Only if you're experienced. Given that that's dependent on your experiential commitments, you can only that can only come about if you have the relevant mental states. So this is just I, I, we don't really need to go through. Are you feel like at this point, if you're kind of on board, you're paying attention to the subscripts here, because this is the notation we're going to use to write our felicity condition. This is the grounds of this condition. So we can have experiential grounding or doxastic grounding, which is to say that your beliefs or your doxastic state determines truth or falsity for the propositions that it grounds. Um, that's something that can come about through testimony. It need not come about through direct evidence. It can come about through inference, right? In all sorts of different ways. Um, and then the normative case on this view comes about only if your normative attitudes distinguish propositions between the true ones, between the true and the false. That's going to entail acquisition of the relevant motivation state. So, how do we then implement this? Now, here's this is going to be the this is the brute force way of doing it, which I, I, we're not I'm not totally satisfied with. But we want to get this project rolling, so we've got to start somewhere. So, this is implemented in the dynamic semantics. Um, what you have here are update functions. So, the single square brackets indicate the dynamic meaning of something, and the double brackets indicate the static meaning, proposition. Um, the semicolon here separates the attitude content from the felicity conditions. So the way we're implementing this at the moment is where individual expressions introduce their own felicity conditions. Um, and that's because we want to distinguish between those that introduce experiential versus normative versus doxastic conditions in the lexical difference. So this is just to say, for tasty, what you do is it takes an input state and it gives you back an output state um, where you've updated with the proposition that the thing that you're talking about is taken. You get to add the world and you get to it. The condition is that the proposition expressed be experientially grounded in the speaker's experiential state. 
So you can't, the S here is the, is the input state. We say you can do the context set. You can't see, remember this, you can't see it in the guts of this, but the, the fact that we're doing a context is determining that it's the speaker. So that's just the basic implementation, and then we define meaning for the, oh, let me say something, right? So the reason why they're choosing notations here, the top one, with the blue, is indicating the default meanings for these types. So Tasty says, I'm grounded in experiential state. Long says, grounded in normative state. Strong says, grounded in doxastic state. To deal with embedding, we want to say that for each of these guys, it's possible effectively to bind the attitudinal state that um, provides the grounding for the use of the expression. That's going to be crucial for doing the modals and the conditional exercise. The negation is just usual set subtraction in a kind of standard dynamic way. Um, and these assertability conditions project up. You're going to get the same assert, you're going to get the same conditions for an assertion of something and its denial. So searching is tasty and searching is not tasty differ in their descriptive content, but they express the same kind of attitude and the same kind of working conditions. The junction is just update with the first thing and then with the second thing, because of course everything's going to be updated with that. All right, epistemic must is bought the acquaintance inference. So here, um, you know, the we got there's a kind of standard dynamic view that you know the update. If you update the input with the JSON and then do anything, the test is passed and returns the input, otherwise it's a failure. We assume that what must does <laughs> itself is introduced uh, a condition that is pre JSON to be doxastically evaluated. So that's a kind of stipulation, must is based on evidence. And so this then gets passed down and indexed to the evaluation down below. And that's the, that's the sense in which it takes you away from experiential meaning and moves to a doxastic sense. We also adopt the view from Glenn Pinto and Gilly that the pre-JSON shouldn't be entailed by the speaker's direct evidence. So, of course, that's kind of forces you to some view like that. Right? Experience is doing it. It's part of the evidence. I don't want to, you guys, of course, this is the one thing that the logic group is probably most interested in, which is how you handle conditionals. Um, I don't think we have time to go through them, fortunately, because I'm not the conditional member of the team. That would be my colleague. Um, if you'd like to know exactly how we do conditionals, ask me. I'll send you the paper. Um, but effectively, the way that, the way that one gets away from the lexically specified assertability conditions introduced by moral or experiential terms or aesthetic terms is by saying that in conditional in conditionalization, you reset the um, the grounding conditions to what we call the trivial partitioning, right? Which is, which is a way of saying that conditional reasoning is cheap. That, that something like that seems right. You know, you can adopt whatever commitments you want, and then do some conditional reasoning. All right. Um, so in those cases, I'll handle the I'm not going to go through hedges. They're going to be handled in the same way. So effectively, these various kinds of expressions can index the commitments and shift them as we get down below. The first stab for the exocentric cases, this would be something like the, remember the anthropologist on Mars sense of example, would just be to say that um, instead of updating the, that when I say uh, it's wrong to use your middle tentacle, um, what I'm proposing we do in that case is not update the common ground relative to the kind of base context in which I'm the speaker, but move to a shifted context where we treat the heptagon as the speaker effectively. Right? That would be one way to do it. This would be a kind of standard context. <coughs> Another way to do it, maybe a more interesting way to do it, especially for the linguists in the room, um, would be to hook this up with recent work which looks quite specifically at the syntax, the, the syntactic, the, the part of the syntactic representations of our utterances that seems to be geared directly to interfacing with speech act type meaning. So there's been a bunch of work over this, I mean, it's an old idea, but there's a bunch of recent work on this that 
provides accounts for things like why in basic assertions the speaker is the kind of is the perspectival anchor, why that flips in interrogatives, and why it's kind of hard to get third personal versions of that, why that takes some work. Um, presumably, whatever we say could slot in with that kind of analysis so that we do not you know, have about a part of the scenario. That will depend to some extent on All right, so to summarize, here's the core bits of the analysis. An assertion of some proposition expresses whatever attitude the speaker must hold to that proposition, given the norms of assertion. An assertion of P is felicitous only if the speaker is in a mental state that distinguishes between worlds in which P is true and worlds in which P is false. That's two ways to kind of think about that informally. P must be grounded in the speaker's mental state, or the speaker must be opinionated. We meant to communicate the same thing, we're not sure which is the best terminology here. Different predicates determine different types of grounding. So the way I set this up for you now, this is a lexical matter. Part of what it means to have an experiential meaning from this view is to impose experiential um, grounding conditions. Or to have a normative meaning is to impose That may not be quite right, but that's that's where that's what it, that's what it's that's how it's stated later. But then, you know, different embedding operators like Epstein, modal expansion, and so forth, their job specifically, in some sense, their function in language is to introduce different grounding conditions, different grounding conditions. And one way to think about what they're doing then is they're modifying the assertability conditions for particular kinds of expressions. That, that's the that's the function of they might be doing other stuff as well, they add issue more, but part of what they're doing is that. All right, so we'll finish up with a few um, key points. So you should wonder what our account of disagreement is. Um, so here's uh, two examples of disagreement. Searchin's tasty, no, Searchin's not tasty. This is a case of so-called flawless disagreement, where it seems that in this intuitive sense, both A and B can Right. Um, series is a mollusk. No, it's not a mollusk. Here's another disagreement where it's not flawless. It's where intuitively one's right and one's wrong because we can know what the facts are. But they need to know what the facts are. We all we don't know what the facts are. Already. So capturing disagreement in our view is no problem, right? Because the at issue component of the meanings is just, you know. It's tasty, says, you know, that, 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 that's going to work. What that's going to do is update the common ground by you know, getting rid of the worlds in which the urchin's not tasty. And it's not tasty, it's going to do the opposite. So these things are not compatible any more than these things are compatible. Disagreement is just disagreement. That's no, no big deal. What's all the fuss? The um, harder, the, the, the Part that's always the challenge for people. Actually, but disagreement is a challenge if you're an expressivist or a contextualist. It's not a challenge for us. It's not a challenge for us at all. The problem for some someone who is a semantic like us is where does the fallacy come from in this case, right? Or another way to put that is where does the sense that these guys are wrong come from in this case? In fact, that's really a better way to think about what's going on in our system. So these are assertability conditions. So all that matters for A to assert this is tasty and for B to assert this is not tasty is for them to have different experiences in the case of sea urchin, which decide the truth of the proposition in different ways. Likewise, all that it takes for A to assert this is that sea urchin is a mollusk and B, not this is, sea urchin is not a mollusk, is for them to have different beliefs. Th that seems right too. Right? So it's this other thing, which is one of these guys is wrong and one of these guys is not wrong, that's the issue. Right? That's the part that we need to resolve. And intuitively, flawlessness yeah. should correlate with the kind of what we might think of the legitimacy of maintaining a difference of opinion, right? So, in the in the doxastic case, it's pretty clear, right? We sort of know that as more facts come in, you should be changing your doxastic state to align with those facts. And given some set of facts, both, whoops, right? Both, at, at some point, 
given the relevant set of facts, if these guys don't align their doxastic states so that they, they become likewise opinionated, so they're, the way that their doxastic states determine truth and falsity for different propositions, including the one that's here from Ramallah, they're going to need to line up, given more and more facts eventually. Otherwise, one would just be irrational. But with the experiential case, there ought to be lots of grounding. The only place where you should get faulted disagreement or fault lead or fault full disagreement for extremes of grounding would be the kind of extreme case where two individuals somehow came to the position where we, everybody knew, they knew, that their experiences were exactly aligned and their experiential judgments were exactly the same. And you know, maybe that doesn't seem unreasonable, that's somehow how we talk, right? Somehow we think people are wrong in their taste because we think that their experiences should be exactly like ours. So that, that's sort of the, the theme along here. Another way to kind of think about how this, this, this is on the right track, if you think about um, cases that fall into disagreement with non-objective language, but vague language, so we can get that. So you get, so that's, you know, Stefan says that sea urchin is big, Maga says no, it's not big, and if they're looking at a kind of borderline big sea urchin, we can hear that faultlessly very easily. We, like, we certainly don't know what it would take to decide who's right or not. If they're both looking at a giant sea urchin, then we think Bob is just wrong. If they're both looking at a tiny one, we think Stefan's just wrong. So it's not that it's about big, it's about the particular case. And the thing about that borderline case is that we sort of recognize that you're never going to be able to get their beliefs to line up in a certain way because one of the crucial beliefs you have to have is where the boundary line between the big and the non big big thing is. And we, we know for whatever reason that's that's not something that we've got access to. Alright. Another thing that comes out of this work, I think, is that the one thing you may have noticed if you were understanding what I was saying is that our, our felicity condition, our grounding condition, requires only that the speaker's mental state distinguish between worlds in which the proposition asserted is true and those of which is false. It doesn't actually require the speaker to be committed to the truth of what they said. It really says they need to be able to draw up the judgments. Um, so that, say, comes from a separate kind of felicity condition we can call it commitment. Um, and that means that then we can think about lying and bullshitting in these different ways. So a violation of a commitment is lying. A violation of grounding, a failure to satisfy the condition of the grounding condition, and still assert. So asserting in the absence of being in a mental state that decides between the truth and falsity of what you assert is an instance of bullshit. That's one way to think about the lying bullshit system. And you know, going back to the teenager and the against her, I think that's kind of an intuition about what's similar about these two cases. Both the teenager and the against her are kind of bullshitters, right? When the teenager says art museums are boring, they might be very well be committed to the truth of that proposition, that they don't want to go to the art museum. But when we discover that they have no experience, we think of them in a way like these are bullshitters. And of course we get that for Objective statements too, aren't there large scale work of art? Right, so the thought here is, you know, no basis, possibly believe, quite possibly believe in the truth of them, but, you know, it's perceived as bullshit by thinking that the, the individual making the assertion can't have a, can't really have a basis for deciding between the truth and falsity of that proposition. Maybe the other kinds of bullshit too. All right, one, a uh, couple final things. So one, um, feature of many expressions is that they have both uh, objective and experiential meanings. So, um, or what, what is that called a quantitative and qualitative interpretation? So if I say that met, this metal is dense or heavy or light, I seem to be talking about the physical properties of the metal. If I say this story is dense, or this story is heavy, or this story is light, I'm talking about how I experience Story, right? Right? It's an experiential meaning. Um, if I have a piece of cake and I say this cake is dense or heavy or light, I can mean either thing. If I pick it up and I say this is, if I use some, if I pick it up, I say this is heavy, I mean one thing. And I eat it and I say this is heavy, I mean something else. <coughs> um, you can 
can see, so if I say the cake is heavier than the pie, it's ambiguous. If I say I find the cake heavier than the pie, it's unambiguous uh, because find takes out the experiential meaning. So one natural X way to think about this in our proposal is that you know this, the meaning of heavy. Or sorry, that should be heavy. That's a typo. That's a cut and paste. Um, the meaning of heavy is just the proposition that something's heavy, and it's underspecified for how it carves up worlds. Depending on whether an assertion of heaviness is uttered with a doxastic versus an experiential grounding. It's going to cut up the world in different ways. So the experiential meaning. So when I say this cake is heavy after eating it, it's sort of in, in that context. It's obvious, clear that my assertion is grounded in my experience, and so that's going to carve up the world in one way between the heavy things and the not heavy things. If I lift the cake up or put it on a scale, I say this is heavy. It's grounded in my doxastic. Um, let's skip that slide and just kind of point to the end. This is the last slide. So if we're on the right track, then we've got a bunch of questions. Um, well, let me go back to that slide a second. So when I gave you these lexicon entries before, we just hardwired in that the grounding conditions for utterances involving them are particular things. We also need to allow those to be fixed by external operators. So one thought would be, you know, maybe they're kind of inherently underspecified, and if compositionally they might get fixed by some operators, but if they're not fixed, then they get filled in in a particular way, and that kind of ambiguity of heavy and dense and light points in that direction. But that then raises this question, which is what, why do particular expressions introduce the grounding conditions that they do, right? Um, so hardwiring it sort of answers that, but in a kind of uninteresting way. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe that's just how we encode experiential meaning or normative meaning, or whatever, as I said before. Something about the meaning of tasting makes it experiential. Could be it's at issue meaning, but it could be the conditions you know, lexicalizing conventionally that is used to do certain things. Um, so that's the thing we need to answer. Another thing we need to answer is whether it's really about assertion or whether this is just kind of a more general use condition on predicates. That's a thing that people might want to think about. Another thing you might wonder about, especially if you're interested in expressivism, is what at the end of the day is the crucial role of the expressive dimension? Actually, what's really crucial for us are these explicity conditions that are introduced. And the we claim that the expressive component comes from them, right? But the fact that there's an expressive component on its own isn't really the driving force. That was, so there's kind of bait and switch. That sort of kind of keeps, gets you on board with the original way of thinking. But then, yeah, that, that part isn't actually doing much for the crucial fact. Um, so we can talk about that if you want. And then the last thing is, given what we're saying here, we have this component that's just updated the common ground in the usual way, but given, if we do, especially if we're keeping the expressive component and we're tracking that certain things are grounded in experience versus normative attitudes versus aesthetic attitudes versus doxastic attitudes, we very likely might want to move to a place where we're doing a little bit more with the common ground than just updating beliefs, but we're also tracking individuals, experiential, normative, et cetera, through it. That doesn't seem unreasonable. That's also kind of intuition behind the whole expressions program. And this sort of gives us essentially the mechanism for doing that as well. Um, that's it. <laughs>